Many thanks to everyone joining us today. And um, I hope um, you have excited as we have regarding this uh, very, very important session that we strongly believe uh, is going to uh, be very useful to every journalist that has an idea, one or one idea or another to really, really uh, be independent. The truth of the matter is uh, journalism is actually uh, not fully formed yet. As, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it continues to evolve and the evolution of journalism uh, is largely dependent on the kinds of innovation and uh, unique approaches to solving uh, some of these uh, issues that we continue to deal with uh, in the journalism landscape. And um, without media entrepreneurship, without innovation, it may actually be extremely difficult uh, for journalism to get to where we desire it to be, which is why I'm really, really excited that we are able to um, we are able to come to you today uh, with uh, with this really, really useful session that we strongly believe uh, will go a long way in helping you in your media entrepreneurship career. Welcome to everybody joining us from across the world. This is a truly, truly global event, and we are truly excited to help you, especially those of you that have already started your media entrepreneurship journey in achieving the desired success, which is sustainability and profitability. My name is Paul Adepoju, and I'm the community manager for the International Center for Journalists, Pamela Howard Forum on Global Crisis Reporting. And today we have the first in the series of partnership that we are having uh, with Elevate, uh, which is a project of the International Center for Journalists. Uh, quick background, around this time last year, I was in Rwanda, in the capital of Kigali, uh, in Kigali, the capital city of Rwanda, and we held one of our very, very highly engaging sessions, which was on media entrepreneurship. And for me, coming from that experience, I was really, really impressed with the amazing number of brilliant media ideas that journalists across the world are actually ideating. And it has become a really, really important goal uh, for us at the International Center for Journalists to help as many journalists that are on this media entrepreneurship journey as possible to succeed. And this is the reason why we are here today on this very, very important uh, session. And I'm joined uh, by Three, uh, two amazing individuals. Okay, three now. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, there is a second Renata. So, <laughs> so I'm joined by Renata, uh, who works uh, with Elevate uh, Project, uh, Jeremy Kaplan, who is our guest speaker today, and uh, a beneficiary of Elevate uh, uh, Project that will learn more about uh, how his project has taken off since participating uh, on Elevate. So let me give the floor to Renata to tell us what Elevate is all about and um, to tell us more about the very important guests that we guest speaker that we have today. Renata, you have the floor. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, we are very excited for this first webinar series. Um, today we have a former participant and Danielle, if you can rename your um, Zoom link, it's better than to have two Renatas right now. <laughs> um, so Elevate is a um, ICFJ's news business hub. It's a mind changing global program. So people from all over can apply. Uh, we help C-level journalists who are running small and medium-sized outlets to develop their business skills. So we know you go to journalism school, you learn everything about journalism. So when you become an entrepreneur, do you have all these necessary skills to make a sustainable business? And this is where Elevate comes in. We help you on the business strategy part, operation and finance, technology, new media, and communication and marketing. Uh, the program is divided in three parts. The first phase is um, the knowledge sprint phase or kind of like the school phase. We have a lot of workshops. You have a lot of work to do after the workshops. Um, then we move to the mentorship phase in which you will, e you will address a business issue that is preventing you from growing and thrive. And the last phase is the grant. So you can apply to receive a, a grant 
to develop a project that will help your organization thrive even more. So this is a seven month program and stay tuned for next year's application that will um, start early 2024. So this is just like a warm up for next year. Um, and yes, we have Jeremy Kaplan here. He's a mentor and a speaker from the program and Danielle is a participant. We are currently in our second cohort. So Danielle uh, participated in last year's program. And we have people from Panama like Danielle, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, South Sudan, Nigeria. We had last year one from Fiji, which was a crazy time zone, right? But everyone is welcome to apply. And I'm going to stop talking now and give the floor back <laughs> to Paul. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renata, uh, for that uh, introduction. So we go straight uh, to the presentation, to the uh, to the. Re uh, to the very, very uh, useful session that I know a lot of people were excited uh, when the announcement uh, was made. So today we are honored to have with us today, uh, uh, Jeremy uh, Kaplan, uh, who is the Director of Teaching and Learning at CUNY's and Numa Graduate School of Journalism uh, in New York City. Uh, Jeremy also leads the school's uh, new Entrepreneurial Journalism Creators Program, uh, which is a 100-day uh, online only curriculum for independent journalists uh, around the world and um, as a reporter uh, at time magazine uh put about digital innovation and after studying public policy at the woodrow wilson school at princeton university he had an he had an ms in journalism as a night big author fellow at Columbia University and an MBA at Columbia Business Review as a Wigas fellow. This is a very, very extensive, impressive um, resume. And uh, beyond the academic qualification that Jeremy has, uh, one of the things that is really, really important is the fact that he has actually been actively involved at different stages, guiding media entrepreneurs uh, through their project and um, suggesting, recommending, and guiding them uh, to success. So thank you very much for joining us today, Jeremiah. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm delighted to be here. I'm uh, thrilled to be able to talk about the subject and to be here with you, Paul. Yes, thank you for having us today. Without wasting much of the time, I'm going to leave the stage so that you can have the floor and um, have a smooth conversation but before i go before i leave the stage i wanted to do something everybody joining us today go to the chat box tell us your name and where you are joining us from and quick shout out to everybody that is watching this live stream on facebook we are happy that you can join us too so please use the chat box to tell you just tell us your name and where you are joining us from hopefully we are going to have some case specific uh, scenarios to discuss that could actually be tailor-made uh, for your region jeremy you have the floor Thanks, thanks, Paul, and thanks everyone for joining. I, I shared a link to a, a little warm up poll in the chat, um, and people are sharing how they're feeling, how you're feeling today. I see a couple of people are feeling excited. I'm definitely feeling excited. Uh, someone said they're feeling okay, I guess they wrote. Um, so that's fine too. Someone's feeling tired, someone's feeling hopeful. So, however you're feeling, you're welcome to be bring bring your full self today and uh, and to absorb and share and uh, respond with your thoughts or questions in the chat as we go. And hopefully you'll take away at least one thing that you can act on, that you can follow up on as we progress today. So my goal today is to share a little bit about my thinking on how, how we can develop what I consider to be a robust portfolio uh, for revenue. So not just one revenue stream, but a revenue portfolio. And I, I think we should aspire not just to survive. There's a lot of talk about just making it through and just surviving. Of course, we need to survive, but I think we should aim for more than that. We should aim to thrive and not just survive. So I, I'm a journalist by training. That's my, my background, but I'm also an educator. That's what I focus on now. And this is these are the three things that are most important about me, just for context, to who, who, who it is here that's speaking with you. And, and as you heard earlier, I'm running the... Um, Journalism Creators Program at the City University of New York. So we help journalists around the world, like you, to create new ventures, new newsletters and podcasts and niche websites around the world. And we've had 150 participants over the last three years from 37 different countries, like many of yours. So 
I'm really, really excited to see all of the, the great things people are building. And it, this is a time of renaissance and rejuvenation for the journalism world, even as some large organizations are facing challenges and the ecosystem faces challenges, individual journalists and independent teams are creating really flourishing, exciting new projects. I have my own new project, Wonder Tools. If you're interested in tools, um, that's my way of keeping abreast of what it's like to be a creator and to be creating a new venture. And I focus on new tools and how they can empower us to be more creative and more effective and more efficient in the work that we do. So in my view, there are a couple of different kinds of revenue streams that we can think about. We can think about direct revenue streams and, and indirect revenue streams. The direct revenue streams are the things that more directly capitalize on the content we're creating, typically the services we're providing directly to our readers, our viewers, our listeners. These are things like subscription services, right? That we provide um, content in exchange for payment, right? Direct subscription, very simple, straightforward, traditional revenue stream, but also things like events where people are paying directly to have an experience. So it's not just the content they're paying for in these kinds of cases, it's an experience they're paying for. E-commerce, where it's not just the, the digital content, but actually potentially something physical. Um, there are several former um, participants in our program who have sold a range of different kinds of products, including t-shirts, including digital products, including um, eBooks. All of these are e-commerce um, products that actually can generate some revenue in particular circumstances. One of the key um, aspects here is to identify the things that make most sense based on your capabilities and your strengths. And not any two organizations are going to have exactly the same strengths or the exact same context. So each revenue portfolio, just like each investor's investment portfolio, should reflect the particular strengths and capabilities of that organization, as well as their objectives and their social and cultural and economic and business context. In addition, there are other um, direct revenue streams like membership, where people are supporting uh, a, a um, news organization, not because they're getting a direct transaction, but because they want to be part of the community. So a subscription is transactional. Membership is participatory. I want to be part of this community and I want to support it, whether or not I'm getting a direct um, bit of content for my membership fee. Um, and then things like education. People are increasingly eager to upskill, to learn about AI, to learn about the new way the world is working, to learn all sorts of new skills, to develop new knowledge. And who better to provide that than journalism organizations that have a great capacity to analyze information, provide information, deliver information effectively. So journalism organizations are in great position to provide education. And education is something that many people um, are accustomed to paying for universities or other organizations um, in, the, in the realm of professional development. Then there are a range of indirect revenue streams. And I'll share, by the way, a, a little bit later, I'll share a link to a whole resource guide where you can go through in depth and look at all of these different revenue streams and lots of examples of each of them. And um, the indirect revenue streams include things like philanthropy, where we're getting support from a third party or individual third parties, individual donors or wealthy organizations. Um, it also includes things like services we provide, for example, to businesses. So these are B2B services that we provide as an organization because we have fantastic photography skills, or we have a videographer who can tell really great video stories, or we have a data analyst, or we have a social media manager, and we can provide those services just like a media agency, just like a marketing agency, just like a content agency. We can provide those services that allow us to essentially subsidize the journalism content we are creating. There's a long, great tradition of cross-subsidization in media as well as in other industries. Our sports content, our entertainment content, our celebrity content sometimes is what generates the revenue and allows us to cover the investigative reporting stories, the accountability stories, the war uh, and conflict that we cover, which is not a money-generating um, set of activities, but it's an important impactful set of journalism activities. So there's always been that kind of cross-subsidization. I used to work at Time Magazine, we had bureaus in Afghanistan and Iraq. Those were money losing sections of the enterprise, but we had other sections of the enterprise that made more money with uh, having to do with celebrities and sports and popular information and technology and so forth. And so in the same way as an organization, we can have indirect revenue streams like services we provide that cross subsidize other elements of our journalism enterprise. And that's a strategy that many organizations undertake and, and works quite, quite well in some cases. Um, so there's a lot of different things we can we can do in terms of developing a revenue portfolio. 
there are challenges with each of the different approaches that we take. And we should be clear eyed and identify which heavy baggage of challenge do we want to pick up? Because nothing is easy when it comes to generating revenue consistently and at a level that allows us to be sustainable. It's not an easy path. And anyone who promises an easy path is selling you snake oil, right? It's difficult. It's challenging. And in many cases, entrepreneurial ventures in particular will fail. That's just the, the, the nature of entrepreneurship. That's the nature of innovation in a complex, competitive capitalistic system. So anyone who promises otherwise isn't, isn't being realistic. Um, but the reality is, if we identify those challenges associated with a particular revenue stream or set of revenue streams, we can take them on head on and we can address them and we can successfully thrive, right? Not just survive, but, but thrive. So for example, um, if we are focusing on subscription, right? We're providing a really great value product. We want people to subscribe to that value product. Um, one of the key challenges is reducing churn. When people have subscription fatigue, they're subscribing to many different things, right? Including, by the way, Netflix and Spotify and all sorts of other things that are competing for their, for their dollars. Um, one of our challenges is reducing churn. In other words, maintaining loyalty, maintaining consistency, that subscription. And a lot of times organizations make the mistake of focusing on getting new subscribers and focus less attention on preserving and cultivating their existing subscribers. By the way, same thing in the realm of philanthropy, right? We spend a lot of attention on getting new donors, but we don't always spend as much attention on cultivating and keeping warm the relationship with those who have already shown a propensity to give. So when it comes to subscription, it's crucial that we continually reach out to those who are subscribing, continually provide um, value to them, which is a challenge, which allow, which is another activity we really have to, to focus on. But that is what makes that particular revenue stream one of the things that makes that revenue stream thrive. When we are focusing on membership, right? Getting people to be members of a community that we're building, we need to really do a lot of outreach and bring people together and identify what it is that people want to get out of this kind of membership and what it is that they can bring to this community. And so those are challenges that we take on when we pursue those revenue streams. And we need to identify what aspects of our organization are really well set up for that. What skills do we have as, as an organization? What knowledge do we have as an organization that we can apply to understanding what it is that's motivating people to, to be a member or to choose to be a member of some other organization? And how can we apply that to our particular organization? Um, in the process of revenue development, we want to go through this five-step process. So wherever you're at in your organization in terms of um, revenue streams that you already have, right? We want to identify um, in the case of any new product or service we're thinking about offering, right? And, and any new revenue stream really entails a new set of activities, a new product that we're going to develop um, because we're going to need to develop a membership onboarding process. We're going to have to develop membership benefits. We're going to have to develop membership communications. We're going to have to develop uh, all sorts of materials and uh, activities that are associated with, for example, membership. Same thing with events. And so we want to go through this process. Uh, and the first step of really assessing the desirability, the feasibility, the viability, and the compatibility of this new set of activities, of this new revenue stream, right? Any new revenue stream that's coming on board. And so desirability means, do, do people actually want this? Like, is there a signal that we have that, yes, if we have this event, this big conference, that our people are excited about it, or people seem really intrigued, people sign up early when we mention we're about to launch something, people signal, they ask questions, they sign up to participate. Those are signals of desirability, right? Feasibility is the question, can we actually do this? So we have just a small team. Can we actually execute on this? Can we actually put bring this together? Running an event, for example, is complicated. It's, 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 it involves multiple moving pieces. And not every organization is set up well to, to do this or wants to do this, right? Um, and the wanting to do this is where compatibility comes in. Is this compatible with our mission? Is this compatible with our goals for this year? Is it compatible with the primary focus we have on the journalism we're doing, right? Is this go going to be incompatible? Is this going to conflict in some way with something we're doing, right? And then finally, the viability, right? Is there a path to making some real revenue with this, right? What do the numbers look like? And this is about scenario planning. So in the scenario where this succeeds wildly, we get a lot of interest. We really fill the hall. We, we have several sponsors. And in the case of an event, for example, 
what does that look like? What do the numbers look like in that scenario, right? But then not just going with the best um, blue sky projection, also going with the dark sky projection. What would it look like if this didn't succeed as well as we hoped? What if we didn't have as many people attending? What if our costs ended up being a little bit higher than we expect? What if uh, we have complications in, ter in terms of additional expenses that, that occur? What would that scenario look like, right? So in addition to the blue sky scenario, the dark sky scenario, we also kind of have a middle of the road scenario. So we have at least three scenarios we're planning for any new revenue stream we're projecting out revenues for and costs for. And we look at that, that array, that, that spectrum of, of scenarios, and we assess, is, does this seem viable? Like, does this seem like it will actually make money? So now we've assessed the, the desirability. Do people want this? Feasibility, can we do this? Viability, can we make money of this? And compatibility, does this fit in with our objectives, our goals, the organization we're aiming to build? And that all leads to the question of sustainability. Like, is this something that's going to contribute to our sustainability as an organization? Once we've done that, and you see here in, in step two here, um, that, that detailed kind of scenario planning and mapping out of the conservative case, the worst case, the best case, et cetera, we start to prototype. So we start to put this together. We start to put the offer to people. We test it, right? We say we have this event. We're looking for, uh, we're, 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 um, we have, we'll have three uh, partner sponsors. We'd love you to, uh, to be one of those partner sponsors. Let's have a conversation about it. So now we're testing this idea that sponsors will help generate revenue for this event. We're testing that out. We're seeing what that what that conversation is like. Maybe we're um, inviting our readers to sign up for to, to be an early sign up for an upcoming event, right? To see if that sign up interest is there, and then we run this pilot event, right? Or we run this pilot project, whatever the revenue stream is, right? If it's an education, if it's a course, if it's a workshop we're offering, um, if it's a service we're providing to a partner that we're charging for, we we pilot that we see what does this look like when we actually do it? How many hours of effort? How complex is it for our organization? How engaging, how enjoyable is it? How, how well do we do it? And how much money do we make? And that allows us to then say, okay, we're adding this new revenue stream to our portfolio, or maybe, or maybe let's try the other one we're considering, right? Because we always have a couple of different options that we're approaching. Our strategy includes a couple of different uh, revenue elements that we could add to our portfolio. So this is again, that, that checklist, the desirability, the feasibility, the viability, the compatibility that we just spoke about. Um, and, and we can look at some individual cases to see how this works in the real world, right? That narratively is, is an organization that came out of our program in, in a decade ago already and has built a really quality news service, essentially focusing on long form feature content. And they came up with a whole range of different revenue streams. And at different times, some of those revenue streams moved up, some of them moved down, but they've been really uh, assertive about not just relying on one set, one revenue uh, approach, right? Because organizations are fickle, partners are fickle, the economy changes, right? The advertising market may go out the window at some point, philanthropists may pull out, right? It, the pandemic may come and you may not be able to do in-person events, right? All sorts of things happen. And so a diversified revenue stream means you're not putting all your eggs in one basket and you have all sorts of different ways to build more revenue as the years progress, which is what Narratively has been able to do through all of these different revenue streams from licensing content that educators could use. Actually, more recently, they've, they've licensed content that film studios can use, and that's a very lucrative area, right? Um, they've also created some custom content. So this is content that they have a little agency within the small organization they have built They've hired a couple people who create custom content for other organizations, right? And they charge heftily for that. So they do it in competition with marketing agencies, for example. And the marketing agencies charge more, but do a lower quality job. So they can offer a better price and a better quality. And if you can offer those two things, you're, you're in a winning position in any marketplace. So this is an example of how Narratively has done this. And another quick case study, um, Richland Source. This is a local site, so very different, much less sexy kind of a, a news organization, just a typical local kind of publication in a relatively small to mid-sized city, right? And typical website, nothing earth-shattering about it, um, but they've created a nice mix 
And it's not always 10 revenue streams, right? It's not always a huge number. It could be a handful in this case, right? So they have some advertising, some local advertising in particular. That's about a third of their revenue. They also, they also have some philanthropy. So people in this area support, want to, want to make sure this is a vibrant area and they're willing to give some dollars. Those are individual donors. There's some uh, wealthy individuals who give a little bit more. And then there's some organizations. And that provides about a fifth of their revenue. Membership, right? Where people get to come to some events, get to be part of this community, get to be on a call to hear about the year ahead and the year that's just passed. They get to uh, get some additional, you know, behind the scenes emails about how they're reporting on stories or follow-ups on stories, those kinds of things. That's uh, a little less than a fifth, about a sixth of their overall revenue. And then marketing services. So they actually provide services for local businesses, local organizations, because they do really, they do a great job with their writing, with their photography, with their videography, with their social media. So local organizations need that set of skills. So those are two examples of how this can be done um, really effectively. And, and even in big organizations, there's diversification going on, right? The New York Times, which is right next door to where I teach at the City University, they have a whole range of new products, right? Because they, they know that their print, their print organization isn't going to last, right? Actually, Mark Thompson pictured here, now taking over at CNN, right? CNN is also beginning to diversify their revenue streams. Right? Because the New York Times and CNN and any other large organization is going to face a tremendous amount of change. So there's no, there's no escaping the massive change we're all going to face. The question is, will we prepare for that or will we be taken by storm? Those are the only two choices we have. We can prepare for the change, anticipate it, preemptively take action and expand our revenue portfolios, or we can let the storm take us. Right? Those are the two choices. So the New York Times has proactively created all of these new revenue streams, right? They have a cooking uh, app. They have games. They have e-commerce. They have all sorts of audio products now. They have a whole audio app, actually. And, they, and, and, and one of the things I want to mention about this is not all of this revenue is direct revenue directly through the product. So, for example, with audio, you can listen to the daily for free. So they're not making direct revenue on that. They're, they're actually, they, they are making some direct revenue through advertising on the daily. But even before they had that advertising revenue stream within the podcast, what, what they were doing was strengthening their subscription revenue line because the propensity to subscribe to the New York Times was almost double once people had subscribed to the audio channels and newsletters. So what that means is that if you take two groups of subscribers, um, two groups of readers of the New York Times, those who just read the paper occasionally on a website are about half as likely to actually end up becoming a paid subscriber as those who not only look at the website occasionally, but also subscribe to one of the podcasts and the newsletters, et cetera. So, so basically they're increasing the propensity to subscribe and therefore increasing the value of each reader um, by incorporating these new outreach channels like audio and like newsletters. And they've also expanded into video. Now, obviously not many, not many organizations have the breadth or the bandwidth to do all of these different things. And I'm not suggesting that many organizations do. What I'm suggesting is that at all levels of the ecosystem, whether you're the New York Times or whether you are a very small independent publisher like uh, Richland Source or whether you're narratively, at all levels, we, we need uh, this kind of uh, revenue diversification and we're actually seeing it. And we're seeing success stories that show that it can work. And you'll hear more from Daniel about, about that as well in, in a few moments. And, and we also need to think about revenue diversification in the context of the whole system of our organization, right? Revenue does not exist in a vacuum, right? It's part of our operational organization, right? So we need operational resilience, meaning we have to have a team that can do these things. We have to have people who aren't burnt out. We have to have people who are excited. We, we have to have um, some sort of budget to expend on testing things, on trying things out, on... on um, on creating these new experiments, right? Because we need an, a mindset that's about experimentation and exploration, right? So that we can exploit these opportunities. And that requires a, a holistic system within the organization, right? And, and I'm not claiming that every organization has that. We, we sometimes need to rebuild some of our infrastructure in the organization to make sure we're set up 
for 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 the development of these new revenue streams. And, and sometimes that means thinking about all of the different stakeholders and what we're doing, right? Who are the businesses around us that we need to cultivate some relationships with, right? Um, who are our customers? What do they actually need? What are their lives like, right? We have to go back to really understanding who we're actually serving. Um, what experts can we talk to to help us figure out how we can capitalize on this on the strengths that we have, right? Or how we can bring our subject matter expertise to these new kinds of revenue products. Um, who are some new collaborators that can help us with this uh, agency we're trying to develop or with this new e-commerce product uh, set of products we're, we're developing, right? Who are great collaborators that have done this with other partners or that we can build a relationship with? Um, and then what other civic organizations or NGOs or other kinds of organizations can we collaborate with? Can we get support from? Can we benefit from in some way, right? So that's, so this sort of stakeholder analysis is part of our analysis of our, our ecosystem and our setup for, for new revenue streams. And, and what kinds of services could we potentially uh, do? I think the services opportunity is, is, is often really significant, even if you're a tiny organization, there's all sorts of service potential that, that, that we often have that we can unlock. Um, with that, I think I'm going to pause and, uh, and see what questions you have. Um, and then, and then I'll share one or two quick final, final thoughts. So happy to take uh, a couple of questions and and hear what you're thinking about, what you want to respond to, and uh, and then I'll have a couple quick final thoughts, and then and then you'll hear from from Daniel um, with with another uh, great case study and, and see how some of this comes into play in a, in a real organization. Yes, thank you, Jeremiah. Thank you so much. So we want to take some questions right now. So the way I see this happening, you have two options. You can either use the Q and A tool on the Zoom platform, or you raise your hand, talk, or tell us about your project and um, what you are working on, and um, where you are stuck and your questions for Jeremiah. So please and please, I really want to hear that. I love hearing directly uh, from attendees. So I wanted to raise your hand and um, indicate your interest in having the mic. Or if you are not, um, if you are not really interested in talking, you can use the Q and A option. But I really know that some people would like to talk directly to Jeremiah. So please and please um, raise your hand and um, we will get to you as soon as possible. But we have a question already uh, for Jeremiah, which is, um, what are your thoughts on the common mistakes to avoid? I know you've mentioned the large number of um, revenue opportunities, monetization strategies that exist and how um, media projects are ambitiously rolling out new tools and new innovative approaches to monetization. So um, let's start with this. What do you think are the common mistakes to avoid when embarking on this journey? First mistake is trying to reinvent the wheel. So many organizations have run events for years right? There's no sense in repeating all of the common mistakes that they make. And I can mention some of those if, if, uh, if that's helpful with regard to events, but it really applies to any revenue stream, right? No, no revenue stream that you come up with is going to be completely brand new. There's nothing new under the sun, in other words, right? It might be new in your context. For sure, it might be new in your context or in your environment, but someone has done something similar in some place, right? So don't reinvent the wheel and make this all the same mistakes others have already made. Instead, take this global village that we're living in as an opportunity to reach out to people. People will, will, will surprisingly respond to your email. They'll tell you five different mistakes they made with their event or what their venue ended up costing and how they negotiated with their sponsors, et cetera, et cetera. They'll tell you those things if you ask them, but you have to be assertive and ask them and go out and get that information so you avoid those mistakes. So that's number one, don't reinvent the wheel. Number two, common mistake is trying to do too many things at once. Right. So, so, you know, on the one hand, we do want a revenue portfolio with a, with a lot of different approaches. Eventually, right. Eventually we want to have a diversified revenue portfolio, but we can't do all of that at once. Most of us have a limited bandwidth. We've got a lot of things we're already doing, right. I know many of you have a lot of things you're already juggling. So you can't adopt 10 things at once. You have to prioritize and focus on one particular objective at a time. Right. And really, really dig in and make the most of that objective before you dive into three other things. Otherwise you'll spread yourself too thin and none of those things will be done well. So focus and prioritize. That's that's the second thing to avoid uh, a common mistake, which is lack of focus and lack of prioritization, right? Uh, the third thing that I would say is to um, jump to the solution, 
So, so oftentimes when we're developing something new, whether it's a new type of event or a new service, we need to, to have a stage where we're doing experimentation and exploration. So we need to try things out. We need to brainstorm. We need to mind map. We need to experiment. Well, what if we did this? What if we did that? And before we jump to the conclusion and, and, and kind of like um, preempt possible good ideas, we need to iterate. We need to improve. We need to say, what are we missing? What are we forgetting in this, in this idea? We, we've got to have this plan for this event, but what are we leaving out? What haven't we thought about yet? How could we do it differently? What if it were shorter? What if it were longer? What if we're in a different place? What if we had different sponsors? You know, what all the think, think really challenge yourself to, to step past your initial assumptions and break out of those assumptions that you've already kind of concluded or fixed. Get other views from around the organization. Ask other people, ask your friend, ask your partner, ask your colleague, ask someone at the barber shop. You know, get, get different viewpoints, get different perspectives, get different ideas before you jump to your conclusions. Um, people often are too quick to say, oh, this is what it is. This is where it is. This is how it's going to work before they've thought through all the possibilities. So th those are the three three things I would say to avoid um, avoid common mistakes. Yes, thank you so much. We have more questions. Uh, my question is, do you have any example from small media organizations who had succeeded in their operation being self-sustainable? And the second question I wanted to add, uh, which is a follow-up to the example from Richland Source, is um, can you share some examples of the marketing services that are provided um, by these uh, media outlets? Sure. Um, so there's so many organizations that it's hard for me to pick just a couple. Um, we, we have literally hundreds of um, participants in our programs who have done really great things. So I'm just going to mention a couple. NK News is one. So North Korea news. North Korea is a very difficult place to provide news, right, for it's for reasons are probably clear to most people here. So um, Chad O'Carroll, who runs NK News, has a diversified revenue portfolio, which includes events, which includes um, different tiers of subscription. So it turns out a lot of government organizations, a lot of NGOs, a lot of universities, a lot of commercial organizations want to know what's going on inside North Korea, because it might affect their business in some way or it might affect their ecosystem in some way. And so they're willing to pay not just for a subscription, but for a pro level of access to data, to an analysis of who's in different you know, uh, um, bureaus of the North Korean government, for example. So, and, and, and various other um, revenue streams that, that he's uh, developed over the years, um, including some consulting and advising and analysis that he can provide based on his, the expertise that he and the organization, and a small organization, right? It's not a lot of people. It's, it's him and a couple people plus freelancers from around the world who help with design, um, as well as obviously individual reporters who are able to get information from inside the country. So that's that's one specific example. Um, another example on the creator side is Geneva Health Files. So this is an individual creator who created a newsletter about global health, right? From within Switzerland, Prithi Patnaik is her, is her name. And she um, basically created an independent venture covering global health, and which is a crucial topic during the pandemic, but really uh, on an ongoing basis, and has experimented with a few different revenue streams, and um, including subscription. And she's become one of the top paid international newsletters on Substack. And that creates a diversification in and of itself, because once you have hundreds of paid subscribers, if one subscriber or a group of other subscribers decides, you know what, I'm not interested, you still have 100 others. Right, so that's a form of diversification in and of itself when you have that diversified subscriber base. So those are a couple of examples I mentioned narratively earlier. Um, that's another one. Um, there's a podcast studio called Multitude that creates not just one podcast but several different podcasts. So they diversify around the topics. They also provide services. So in addition to creating their own podcast, they help other people develop their podcasts. Right, including businesses that want to have their internal podcast. Right. So they do coaching. They also do training. They also um, do the podcast development creation services, editing a podcast for people. So they diversify the services they provide. In addition to getting advertising for the their own podcast, they tell advertisers, if you buy an ad on our podcast, we can also provide you ad space in all of these other podcasts. So they become a kind of, they created a kind of network for podcast advertising, which adds an additional revenue stream because they take a portion of the ads sales they sell for other podcasts. So those are all examples of small independent organizations that create revenue from newsletters, from websites, and from podcasts. And there's many, many others. It's a really exciting time. In fact, I'll share a resource with everyone here. Um, 
which is a, uh, a revenue portfolio database, right? This is a, I uh, just put it in the chat, bit.ly slash revenue portfolio. This is free for, for you all to, um, to look at, to explore. And it's a resource guide. It has lots of different examples of different kinds of revenue streams. If you want to dive into them, to my point earlier, no need to repeat their mistakes. And also you can discover new ideas. You can realize, oh, wow, I, I had never thought about trying this kind of revenue stream. Um, so I encourage you to explore that and and uh, and see see what you can find in there that might might be relevant and helpful for you as a use case. Thank you, Jeremiah. Before we pause uh, these, uh, we have lots of questions for you, but I want to go to Daniel, but uh, let me ask you these three last set of questions. Uh, the first question is, um, how do you keep yourself organized uh, for somebody that is trying to embark on this journey and uh, try all of these um, different channels of uh, profitability? Then we have two questions from different persons from Pakistan. The first question has to do with um, um, is that for the countries where we face issues related to national economic and struggles as a nation, what and how can we go along with um, the subscriptions? Consumers may not be ready uh, to pay for subscriptions, thus creating a knowledge gap. While the second question from Pakistan is, uh, can you please rationalize? Rationalize revenue expectations and pie sizes between larger and small organizations. And if you could also dilate on the lifetime journey of some of these streams to reach sustainability. Dupandi, can you combine these three questions? <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot in there uh, <laughs> in a short amount of time. Um, so uh, first of all, in terms of how to stay organized and so forth, I I I could spend days talking about this because I love this subject. I think we don't pay enough attention to the tools we use. The tools we use are really empowering for us. They allow us to work more creatively, more enjoyably, more effectively, to reach people in all sorts of new places um, more, more, more uh, successfully. So I, I do share those um, for free in my newsletter, Wonder Tools. Uh, I put the link in. If you're interested in exploring those, feel free um, if that's useful. In terms of the... The last question, um, I'm not sure I got the full gist of it. I guess, can you just summarize that last, that last okay. one? Okay. The last question has to do with uh, countries where um, there, are, there are economic issues that the audience, that the content for that, that platform may be targeting may not have the financial strength to enter into subscription services. So what yeah. is recommendation for that while the second question from the same country has to do with um, rationalizing rep, uh, revenue res, uh, expectations and um, if we could dilate on the lifetime journey of some of the streams to reach uh, sustainability yeah so I, I'm, I'm putting in a link to global press um, and uh, the the founder is has a new book called Byline, and she spoke to my class yesterday. And and this is someone, Christy, who has created an organization which allows for proximity reporting instead of parachute reporting. So instead of having people come in, foreign correspondents, it's local people in countries around the world who are reporting on their own cultures, their own countries, their own issues, and their and and it, and it's they have a non-assignment policy, which is very interesting. So the reporters themselves decide what they're reporting on, how they're going to report it, and they bring it to life. And they've done phenomenal, impactful reporting around the world. And the reason I'm mentioning it now is because they also are a very sustainable organization, and they sustain themselves despite the fact, or or in addition to the fact, that they're working in countries all over the world where there are relatively low low income um, readers and listeners and viewers. And, and citizens, and that, and that the way they do that is through philanthropy. So I, I recognize that philanthropy levels of, of philanthropic giving vary widely across the world. Of course, that's that's certainly true. Um, but I do think that we have the potential in the years ahead to draw the attention of philanthropists to to, to show them that the impact that journalists can have or our journalism organizations can have is substantial. And a lot of the work that we're doing is a public good, right? Just like clean air, just like clean water, just like safety that we all rely on in healthcare and services like that. Those are public goods. And we don't rely on the commercial market to generate all of that, right? We rely to, to some extent on uh, government support, but also on the goodwill of philanthropists, universities, charitable organizations, NGOs. And so I, I do feel that that is an important part of the ecosystem and it will be a growing part. In the US, less than 1% of charitable giving goes to journalism organizations. Right? That means all sorts of other, and many of the other ones are very important, of course, 
but there are also many things that people give to that are, have less impact than journalism, in my view. And I think that's true around the world. And so I think that for organizations around the world that are operating in places where there is um, low capacity to pay among some of the target, direct target readers, listeners, viewers, I think one of the things we have to move towards, and I'm, I'm not suggesting this is easy, it's not easy, but I think one of the things we have to move towards is a greater participation in the philanthropic sector. We need greater support from organizations that wanna make the world a better place, that want to address the issues that journalists, like all of the people um, gathered here, are, are addressing with their journalism. If, if, you, if you're covering climate change, the people who are supporting you know, climate change philanthropy should be supporting this journalism, right? If you're addressing women's rights, and literacy rights and maternal health care, like the journalists who are covering those issues and making an impact on those issues should be supported by philanthropists who care about that. And we need to make that case in a strong way. And with the support of other organizations that are empowering us, like ICFJ, like INN, the International, um, the, the, uh, the uh, Lion, uh, all, all sorts of organizations that are journalism supporting organizations, um, with the collaboration, we can hopefully build a stronger um, base foundation of support for many of these organizations um, to, to ensure that they're sustainable. Um, but, but it's not an easy question. I, I don't claim that that's a complete solution. That's, that's one part of it. And that's the, the, the part we have time to, to talk about now in this short, short space. Yes, absolutely. We need to go to Daniel uh, as soon as possible, but uh, we have Ivanilsin Ramos on the line. Um, Ivanilsin, are you ready to ask a question? Uh, actually, right now, I'm not. Okay, um, we'll go to uh, we'll go to Daniel right now. And um, so, Daniel, how are you doing? Hope things are going well. All good, all good, and I'm very happy to be here. And thank you for uh, to IFCFJ and Jeremy Kaplan, who was an amazing teacher in LA Elevate last year. Uh, so I can um, share some of the things that we have uh, been doing since Elevate with you guys. Please go ahead. <laughs> well, one of the things, and I'm happy to see people from all over the world here. I see like South Sudan and like the Philippines and all that stuff, because one of the struggles that we have, like in Panama, it's a developing country. Um, one of the things that we have is the, the, the whole system of like how journalism should work and all that stuff is very like US based or like Europe based. And, and it works in those markets and it's very hard to adapt it to the markets that we have in like in, in our countries and i absolutely agree with the last question that that was given to jeremy about like maybe people are not ready to like put their money into this sort of uh initiatives and that's something that we struggle to so i understand exactly what you're going through um i'm going to show you a little bit of i don't know if can i share my screen i can't right i think i can oh yeah I go can. for it hold on a second um I want to share with you. Oh, I can't right now. Can you? Yeah, I have to do a whole thing and just do it in the meantime. Um, so, uh, Fogo Panama, I'm the co founder of Fogo Panama. And uh, one of the things uh, that we started as a sort of like a collection of different initiatives. I had a new satire kind of website kind of show. Uh, my friend Mauricio, the other co founder, had a more like on the street reporting of like going to like protests and all that stuff. Uh, Irma, which is the other part of our team had more investigative journalism. Uh, so we just decided to team up um, to create this new thing called Poco Panama, which is uh, in, in four years, we have become the, the only, not the only, but the primary uh, digital news outlet in Panama. We are we're only digital um, and one of the things that we started with was because we partnered with a sort of like anti-corruption movement, it's called Moin. Um, we had access to their donors. So we pitched them the idea of like, look, we're gonna create a news website that is gonna be corruption based. Like we're gonna fight corruption. We're gonna do investigative reporting towards that. They were very happy about it. And they gave us enough to last us for like a year and a half. And this was 2019. So we quickly realized that we needed to uh, do some things to get us uh, started because we only had one year and a half to operate. Um, and the first thing that we did was try to do um, like regular advertising. Like that was the thing, like okay, that this is how the market works and how that's how media works, that you sell advertising and you, and you, and you try that. 
uh, we did and advertising it's been really good to our to our our news outlet uh, right now it's about like 60 percent of our revenue stream is advertising we have a couple of clients that work with us they're very happy uh, with the exposure that we get we get in a lot of trouble uh, because of our uh, investigations and I'll, I'll talk to you guys about it later um, so that is that has been always um, a struggle that we have with advertising because clients sometimes clients do not want to be attached to like problematic situations where like we get sued or we like get threatened and all that stuff uh, but we have maintained uh, four or five clients that have been with us since the beginning or since the middle and they like they've been really good to us and i'm very happy for them um, but then when we started uh and i'm just talking about revenue stream here um when we started with elevate last year uh one of the things that we realized and because of jeremy and all that you just saw that was exactly what was in my brain is like i we need to diversify this thing because it makes no sense to have only like philanthropy and advertising that was our whole revenue stream was that philanthropy we had a couple of donors if at the end of the year we didn't like we did we were not going to cover our budget i could go to them and like talk to them and explain what we were doing and they would give them, give them the money uh, for that, but that was a whole thing. And also like, you don't like, as a journalist, you don't want to be tied completely to like this person that is giving you money to philanthropy, even though I'm pretty sure that they're doing it from like the bottom of their heart. Like that's a string that you, you try to cut loose as soon as possible. So when we started elevate, one of the things like elevate is like, a sort of like a mini MBA that you get, like we, like I'm a journalist, like I love telling stories. That's what I do. And that's what I like to do. And, and one of the things that always happen is we want to tell our stories, but we have no clear picture of like how this thing is going to work and in and, and the business side and like how we're going to get the money and how we're going to pay some of the services that we need to pay. Um, and that's something that we don't quite put our minds into it like journalists because we're, we're like emotion driven. We're like, we want to tell stories. I want to fight this. and I want to do this. Um, but that's why Elevate was so important because it was like a, a, a focus on like, okay, no, but, but you also need to know about like budget and numbers and like projection and all that stuff. Um, so that's what we did. And we quickly, and we realized that we needed to do uh, uh, subscriptions because, and that's one of the things that happened with the, let me see if I can quickly, uh, Paul, I'm really sorry. I'm just gonna go off here for like a second to see if I can share my screen because I wanna share some things with you. Oh, I need to, oh, I need to quit. Okay, Paul, can I leave the meeting for like 30 seconds or maybe less, like 15 seconds so I can just like reopen Zoom so I can share my screen with you guys? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So while, be, while you I'll do that, um, I will bring on Jeremy back. Uh, we have, uh, we have um, more questions for you, Jeremy. So let's quickly go to Dale's questions while we are waiting, Daniel. So the second question has to do with uh, what do you think should be the next cost to profit ratio I, that is ideal for revenue streams to deem them viable? There's no one number that will work for everyone. And anyone who gives you a singular formula for something like that isn't being honest about the complexities and the nuances and the distinctions in, in each individual situation. So there's no no single formula. What I would say is, the costs projections that people usually have, they under forecast and the mm -hmm. revenue projections, they over forecast. Mm -hmm. So in any forecast you make, any projection you have, and that's why I talked about scenario planning earlier, any projection you have, you should immediately assume a 20% range on either end, right? And, and particularly uh, when you're projecting costs, you, you should project at least a 20% overage, right? If not 40% overage. And in revenue, you should project a 20% shortfall, if not a 40% shortfall. And if in the worst case scenario, this looks problematic, you should think twice about your setup and think about whether you can revise accordingly. Yeah, Daniel is back, but Daniel, you are still bearing yeah. Renata. So while you fix your name, let me quickly fix your name. Let me quickly ask Jeremy this question. We'll still be back with Jeremy. As an educator in media entrepreneurship, would you say journalism entrepreneurs would benefit from thinking about journalism as a regular business, or is this still something different from a regular startup? Well, I think it is a regular business if you're trying to make money, right? So you're competing in the real world. People have real money. You're trying to get their money. You need to compete with any other you know business that's that's uh trying to attract their 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 money 
Um, but we also need to keep in mind that we're special, right? We're, we're, we have a, a higher goal. We have a higher calling, just like other social enterprises. I think a social enterprise is a way to think about it. So social entrepreneurship is a, is a field that is broader than just journalism, but I think journalism can be a subset of that broad sector of social entrepreneurship. So yes, we have to think of ourselves as a business, but also we have to recognize that we're doing important, impactful work. And it's not just about the bottom line. It's also about the impact we're having with our work. Thank you, Jeremy. I'll be back. And Daniel, oh, it's back, back to you. Can you, see my, can you see my screen right now? Absolutely, yes. Okay, perfect. So this is our platform. This is Foco Panama. And I'm showing you the Instagram uh, uh, um, page because that's how we started. We realized um, because we had access to some polls that would happen in 2019 because of elections, uh, in those polls, like vast majority of people said that they were getting the news from Instagram. Uh, and the only true journalism that was positioned on Instagram at that moment was very, very light. It was the, the Instagram accounts of traditional media. So it was the, like they were not, they were just the same thing that they would put on print. They will literally just like cut it and like put it on Instagram and all that stuff. Um, uh, so we realized that there was an opening for like a, a, an Instagram-y way of telling the news. And that's how we got ourselves in. Um, we also realized that people were getting their information from like influencers and, and people that like had no like journalism uh, process of getting to the information, delivering their information. There were just people that were famous for talking there and they would just like laugh about like the, the daily news. Uh, so we realized we had to like mix those two things together, like a, a journalism, like a strict journalism process with a way to put it outside that it was very Instagrammy and very influencer. So um, one of the things that we did that was non-traditional is that we attached very clear faces to it. So my co-founder and I um, became like, we had to become sort of like influencers and, and we had to like uh, uh, see how these people became famous and the things that they did to become famous in whatever they did, like sports or like gossip or whatever, and attach that into like, we're gonna deliver the news in, in, a, in a sort of way. So after that, and, 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 and because we had a couple of incidents where people were uh, um, uh, uh, denouncing our accounts on Instagram and Twitter because of our work, uh, we decided that we needed a web page because the web page is the only thing that it's that it's actually yours. Like Instagram, like your Instagram belong account doesn't belong to you. It belongs to like Meta. And your Twitter account doesn't belong to you. It becomes it belongs to Elon Musk. And, and what has happened with X makes you realize how quickly those things can change. But the web page is the only thing that is that is yours. Like you pay your hosting, you pay your domain, and, it, and it's absolutely yours. So we had to develop uh, a, a website for it. And we have been going really well. Elevate was amazing for it because we, we for the first time, we actually went to like the analytics of it. And like we, we saw a glimpse of like how we can play with analytics. This is our current revenue uh, diversification. It's not very diversified. I'm sorry, Jeremy. Advertising is taking a lot of like a lot of space there, but we're working on it. Um, but uh, uh, two years ago, like subscriptions were zero, and advertising was like ninety percent of it. Um, and philanthropy was the other part. I completely agree with Jeremy, and that's our pitch for like the people that are like give uh, give money to us. Uh, we have these rounds that we go uh, maybe once or twice a year to them. And, and that's the thing, like we are doing a public service, especially, and I don't know if that, that will work for you, but there's a lot of people that are good, honest uh, business people um, that are very tired of seeing how other people cut in line um, for um, whatever they do. So, so for example, like one of our big donors is this guy that has like a medical supply uh, uh, um, a company, and and the reason why he why he came to us and we and we managed to convince him to like help us was because he was tired of people with close ties to the government coming in line like with you know the not paying shipping or uh, not paying like you know the the I don't know how they call it when the product enters in the, when the product enters the, the the country they need to pay like a tax for it so people cut in line for those things. Um, and there's a lot of people like that. And that's the people that are, I talk to. And I go like, well, this is why you need to uh, support us because that's what we do. Like we expose these people so that we can level the playing field um, and everybody can make an honest living without having to like publicize. 
Um, also merch, it's a it's a five percent of worth. That's one of the things that we're doing. The new products that we're uh, 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 launching uh, this year. We have a couple of t-shirts and 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 and, and hats. Uh, one of the things I realized because we're very like an activism kind of political uh, uh, website, um, we are going to do designs, and we have done designs in the past that are not only about the brand, but are like about, about a political or like a cause message. Um, so right now we have one that is the that's like a t-shirt, and it's like they're like they're not they're gonna ignore you until they can't anymore, uh, with like our logo and all stuff, so that people are like happy and proud to wear the t-shirt instead of just like a t-shirt with your with your logo on it uh it's more like a cost and we have we have been pairing up with a, a company that does uh, the t-shirts so we can do like seasonal kind of thing so if we for example um we release a corruption scandal we can do some merch about that political scandal so that people can like be proud of wearing it um and then subscriptions and and the, the way we are right the subscriptions was that like if we don't want to be tied out because we had a thing so we had advertising and we had two bad things that happened with advertising uh in our and one of the things that Jeremy was talking about was like mistakes uh one was because we're very, very political and um and we're very problematic we have a lot of like um suits and like you know uh, processes in like the judicial system because of the work that we do and uh, uh, because of the, uh, the, the corruption scams that we do. Uh, and one of the things that started to happen is when you have small um, companies that advertise with you, sometimes in order to get to you, they will get to that company first. So one of the things uh, that happened was that two very small advertising companies, like friends that had like a restaurant and all that stuff, uh, they called me in panic because some person that was suing us um, uh, started going after them and like threatening them to sue them for advertising in our platform. Uh, so that was a problem that we have with small businesses. So so we don't have small businesses uh, anymore because also we don't want to like threaten the livelihood of those people. That also can lead to like government being way more strict than they should be uh, with like their their, their 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 permits or all that stuff. And the other really, really, awful time that we had was this thing. And we, one of the, our, one of our uh, advertisers, it's a mining company in Panama, which is in, in a very, it's in a very delicate situation right now because the, the, the judicial system said that the mine was unconstitutional. So re, they're redrafting the negotiation between the government and the mine. And when they approach us to do like, sort of like advertising, uh, we did it, and one of the things that we failed to realize was how our audience was going to feel about it, and there was a very strong anti-mining sentiment in the street, um, so we came with this, this post that it was just like an advertisement, like it was literally just a video from the mine, and that number that you see right there, 424 quote cool tweets, it's all, they're all like either insults or like, like I'm disappointed messages and all that stuff. And it was a really big hit that we took. Um, and one of the things we realized is that we failed to listen to how our audience saw us uh, in relation to how we worked with advertising. Um, because we didn't like, the, like that was the first time that we did advertising in the sense of like, I'm just gonna put your video that you sent to me, like the company, I'm just gonna put it here. Um, and so we had to reflect on that. And one of the things that we did after this was like release a video telling our audience like, hey, we need to pay the bills. This is a company that wanted to advertise with us. If you don't want this to happen in the future, then support us. And then like, you know, you can support us. And that like that worked. There was a lot of people that were still mad, but that worked. And, 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 and around like 60 to 80 to 100 people subscribed to our product. And so we, we, we partner in that moment, we set it up with Stripe, uh, which Stripe is a great tool for us, but we, you need to check because we have so many international people here, you need to check how your country works with Stripe because there are some banks outside of the US that don't necessarily have like that link so that you can like bring money from outside like through PayPal or like Stripe and all that stuff. So I do encourage you to check if you can't bring the money, because that's a possibility, Panama didn't have it until like two years ago, um, you can always do PayPal. And so you can try to see how you can 
use PayPal in the expenses that you have in your in your in your in your office or in your company so that you can use that money that it's not going to be directly to like paying salaries or whatever or maybe they can but like through PayPal but you need to check that uh, we're working with Stripe I don't know uh, uh, how you're going to work with that so one of the things that we did was okay if we're going to do subscriptions one of the things that we have that would probably also something that you have is we don't have a lot of hands like we're like six people so like why can I give my subscri subscribers that does not affect my workflow because I cannot like there's no way I can give like like exclusive content for them that I prepare and because that's the, like I have that people working on something else um so we started to, to to brainstorm a couple of things and one of the things that worked for us that we worked uh, during Elevate was this film called uh Detrás de Camera so behind the scenes and what we realized is that a lot of people all the followers that uh, uh, all those subscribers that we had were very politically engaged people they were very uh, in the gossipy thing of like what's happening in politics. And we as journalists have a lot of information. Uh, and some of that information we can disclose or we can put it on uh, 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 a whole page because of many things, because it's an unverifiable information, because there is a conflict with another investigation that we're doing or whatever. So what we did was we gave our subscribers access to that only subscribers would set up uh, an email through like our our newsletter which is we work with Mautic. um so we have the database for our subscribers and we send them a weekly email saying like this is what's happening behind the scenes so like you see that project that is going through a national assembly where this person had a meeting with this person and this lobbyist is pushing for like this thing and all that stuff and, and it really worked and people loved it because they had exclusive access to these things that the general audience is not getting. And it wasn't very like work heavy to for ourselves because it was information that we already had. So it was just a matter of like, where are we gonna do this week? Let's sit up, uh, discuss a couple of information that we have and we just like uh, had the email. So that was only for subscribers. The other thing that we developed through Elevate was this thing called focal atos. One of the things that we had, I'm sorry, I'm gonna see here. One of the things that we had was our one of our the people that work for it, it's a it's a, a, a tech genius. And she managed to do a, a scrapping website that will take all of the decisions from the judicial system that they have scattered all over their web page that you can't find like there's no reason there's no way you can find it uh, organically and a robot goes into the website scatter all the stuff and organizes it and that's what we have like one of the best judicial covering in panel because we have access to that so then we realized during our conversations with elevator our mentors it's like okay we can monetize on this like bit because like we use it for journalism but we realized that there were people like lawyers that did not have that for their clients so we started working with, with some of the like the big law firms and we're like we have something that will cut you the cost of like having a person physically going to the judicial system offices and like look for the decision that just came out a copy you need to talk to somebody i'll, I'll have that for you uh set up as an alert so if you're working in a case with like let's say a brand whatever volvo um you can do an alarm with us, uh, and I have it here. Um, so that it, like when a decision is made for Volvo in the judicial system, it'll come to your email immediately. And then you can have the decision there, and then you can go and, and, and have somebody send it, but you 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 cut costs on that sense. We're still like we just finished setting it up uh, because it was it was for us, so it was all scattered and like a little bit disorganized. So we had to put it pretty and like you know, with, like a good template and a landing page and all the stuff and the tariffs. So we established this tariffs, which is a uh, personal familiar and, 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 and business. So for businesses, for example, a hundred year, a hundred dollars a month, and it will set you 50 alerts. So if you're working on 50 cases or, or 25 cases or whatever, you will have, uh, uh the, this, um, this service and personal is, because we also realize like, if you are in a, in a, in a legal situation, um, for yourself, be like a lawsuit or whatever. Uh, we realize there's a lot of people that were paid to like keep track of their like of their uh, judicial situation. So we're launching this one. 
where I don't have a, a, a percentage of how, how it's going to go. I'll let you guys know so you can share with the, with the class how that goes. Uh, but that's what we have. The other thing that we have, and before we go to Q&A, uh, is like Jeremy said also, um, so grants or like um, international support. Um, and I don't know how you guys work in, in, in your each uh, medium, but one of the things that we have, because we get in a lot of trouble, um, there's a couple of things that have happened to us uh, where we have uh, a network of organizations like FCAJ and like other organizations that we can talk to and be like, we need help with this. Be it like talk about it so like the, the so that it, it intensifies the, the situation that we're in. But like there's, for example, and I cannot thank enough, there's an organization called Free Press Unlimited in the Netherlands. Uh, which is a fund for journalism in distress in, in, in different categories. So for example, one time uh, one, a person attacked my, my co-founder in the street, stole his, uh, his equipment and his laptop um, because we were working on a big investigation. And I immediately contacted Free Press Unlimited and they were like, absolutely, like, what do you need? Like, I need, you need to replace the laptop. We'll talk about it, blah, blah, blah. Send us a request and all that stuff for legal assistance as well. So we're like, we're, we're like, we spend a lot of money in lawyers. Um, so uh, Free Press Unlimited, for example, was like, okay, so if you, like, if you have a big case coming up, but we, we had a big case and, and my co-founder was almost uh, uh, sentenced for like uh, gender violence because of an investigation that we did to a congresswoman. Um, so like, that was a big case and Free Press Unlimited was there and be like, how much are you spending on lawyers? I'll have, so there is a network for journalism in uh, journalists in distress around the world, UNESCO has a couple of grants too about like uh, uh, media. So be on the lookout for those opportunities to uh, apply to these grants so you can. Uh, 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 um, and just you know, this is a this is a uh, this is it's a hustle. Like you you're in it every day. It's a grind. Like you're in it every day. You're not only telling stories, but you need to you need to. To get the revenue to work on those stories because otherwise the stories are not going to come up. And I think I'm, oh, I'm still on Brazil. I don't know, I'm already on a little bit. Uh, so I'm open to any questions that you have or, or I don't know how we're going to proceed. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. I, we are in, on the last lap, uh, way beyond. Uh, uh, time share this. So, but we'd like to take a uh, few, just a few more questions. And I'd like to go to our community on Facebook, and um, I think um, they are also actively engaging uh, with us and see if we have any questions. So um, there is this question that I saw from Halis. Um, Halis would like to know, how do you create um, operational resilience if other revenue sources fail to work out? So I'll start with Jeremy then um, I'll have insights from Daniel. So the question from um, Alice Chizanga is, uh, how do you create operational resilience if other revenue sources fail? Uh, so operational world resilience is, is a little bit separate from just the, the revenue question. So operational resilience is about uh, a combination of things. It includes training, so it includes training reporters in terms of how to handle situations, emergency situations, but also how to, you know, have a life balance if they're ending up being burned out or overwhelmed. It involves um, duty of care support. So basically making sure that reporters and journalists, including editors as well, have the support they need, right? That means they're paid um, adequately. They have... Um, access to support of other kinds, right, that they need. So, so operational resilience has a, is, is a combination of things. It's not just about revenue. It's about setting up the organization in such a way that people are well prepared to do their jobs effectively. And, and, and once they're able to, to, you know, do their jobs effectively, then we're in a position to develop new revenue streams, expand the, the sustainability of the organization. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And um, so, uh, Daniel, uh, if uh, that we have a question for you, and um, I don't want, I would have said if you had your own thoughts on that, but I think we have a question from Gibran specifically for you, which is, uh, Daniel, can you talk to, can you talk about collaborations, whether monetary or content ETC, uh, what has been your experience like? 
Collaboration with what? Sorry, I didn't get that. Collaborations in general. With other, okay. It's been, we are, because we're very problematic, like I said, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, enemies because of our work. Um, collaboration is all, not always easy. I have actually found more uh, that I'm, we're more welcome outside of our country than we are inside of our country. So it's very hard to work with other news outlets within our countries because of the image that we have of like, you know, we're like the rebel kids of like Panamanian journalism. But we have managed to work with Central American uh, news outlet in other stuff. And that creates some, that creates two things that are very good. Again, because we're talking about like, if we're talking about journalism, it's another thing, but right here, we're talking about like the operational and the business side of it. It gives you two very important things, collaboration. One, um, it gives you sort of like a renowned, like, like we're doing an, like an international uh, uh, investigation. And that gives you clicks outside of your country. It gives you something amazing to put on resumes when you're talking about like grants or when you're talking about the philanthropist that you're trying to approach that gives you certain status that you need to like, uh, that, that it, it's really good for your pitch. Um, and another thing, it's, it gives you a different perspective so that you can get, one of the things, for example, is uh, in Panama, and I'm pretty sure that in countries, it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, YouTube doesn't work the same as in the United States. So YouTube, for example, gives you like a dollar for any uh, 10, uh, 1,000 views on the United States. Here, it's like 35 cents of, uh, of that dollar. Um, same with the Google Ads, same with the Google Tens and all this stuff. Like in Panama, it's less. So one of the things in Panama is very small. We're 4 million people in Panama. So one of the things that we do and we try to do is one time, for example, we partnered with like a Costa Rican, Nicaraguan and El Salvadorian uh, uh, news uh, outlets to do an investigation about our company. And that opens you up to a whole different market of people that are going to see your content and and that will give you uh more remedy because it's not we're very localized in like pedamine in politics uh so we don't get that opportunity you also did something with venezuela venezuela has you know 40 million people in venezuela so like if you do something that attracts to that market that will give you more views more clicks more everything because your market is bigger so that collaboration for example for me that has that has worked and like not looking at like collaboration with Panamanian outlets, but like, like with outlets outside, I've seen more beneficial to us. Thank you so much. So for the last question, I'll bring, um, I think I would like um, Daniel and uh, Jeremy uh, to answer this question and it's from Maria. Uh, Maria is asking, what kind of revenues or revenue model would you recommend to digital media operating in Excel since they cannot operate in their home countries because they are persecuted by authoritarian regimes, cases like Russia, Venezuela, or Nicaragua, media digital, digital outlet in Central America. Um, so let's start with Jeremy. What are our thoughts on this? So first of all, it's it's a it's a hugely challenging thing, right? Um, let's just say that to begin with. Um, second, I would say we can look to some inspiring examples. Efecto Cucuyo is one. I just posted the link in the chat um, from Venezuela. Um, Luz Meli Reyes was in our program a, a while back and was able to really maintain and with her colleagues and partners and collaborators to maintain and grow that organization in a very difficult circumstance in Venezuela and gain support from people within the country who could support it, those who could, uh, many couldn't financially, but some could. And, and many outside the country could support it. And, and she and her team was adamant about not taking government money because they didn't want to be corrupted or influenced by governments, but they did, um, they, you know, they, they, they were open to other people who wanted to support the organization as long as they could do it transparently and it wouldn't conflict with, you know, their ethical principles or, or their quality journalism. So, so there are organizations that we can look to as models. And again, as I said um, earlier, I would encourage people always to find like people, right? So you know, it's easy for me here in New York to say as someone who's not in exile, you know, to give you some guidance, but I would encourage you to find people who are in a similar boat. We have a journalist in residence from Russia, right, at the City University right now who um, helped start the RAIN um, TV network in Russia. And, and he and many others have had this experience, have been in this experience, Luz Meli Reyes from Venezuela, many others, reach out to those people, share your, your circumstance, and, and learn from what they've done. Their case studies are out there. They've written about what they've done in many cases and, and learn from what they've done. Look for other people in exile, right? There are many other people who are 
um, refugees from various countries who are interested and really want to support the place where you are working, right, or the, the work you're doing. So they may no longer be in their home country like you, but they, they are still potentially willing to support. So find those people as well. Those would be my primary um, observations. I, I think I have, well, I have two answers for that. One is a, a very operative one, and a very like a very inspiring one or a very cynic one. The inspiring one, we had El Pitazo in our cohort of Elevate last year, which is an amazing Venezuelan project as well. Uh, it's an, an operation, like a very big operation that they have. And they work with in, in exile. I had the, uh, I met with him in, in, in Madrid last year. Uh, they work like the heads, there's one head in Venezuela, there's another head in Madrid because of political prosecution. Um, and they have, they have managed to have still have ties with Venezuela. They work this amazing thing, which is like community journalism, where they empower communities to become sort of like correspondents for their media. Um, and they work in, in, in exile. Um, they work with grants because of the Venezuela situation is very present. They work with that. The more scenic one that I have is nostalgia sales. So if there's a journalist that it's in exile, that probably means that there's a huge community of exiled people anywhere or people that have left the country. And for those people to have a, 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 like a news outlet that understands what they're going through and that look at their country with the same nostalgia that they do uh, works very well and they're very eager to support that. They're very eager because it's not what's happening in the country um it's it's the sense of of longing of like oh this is what happened in the country that you had to leave that all i also had to leave and that creates that creates a bond between like the medium if you manage to like strike that tone and that way of talking and the way of transmitting that it's that it's near to that person of like you're feeling the same thing that i'm feeling uh that can create a link between between people people that are going that, that are leaving the country maybe not for political persecution because of a lack of economic opportunities or because they had a better opportunity outside and they would be willing to support your project if they feel like you understand them in the, in the sense that you have a lost country going on out there. So I think those two things, uh, belonging and the other thing is like it, it can work because there's a lot of projects that work like that in, in Panama. So Venezuela is really close to, the, uh, to where I have Nicaragua as well. We have a lot of Nicaraguan uh, exiled journalists that work from Costa Rica, that work uh, from from Panama, and that's what they do. They they it's the same thing. It's a hustle. They just have. But one of the things that they do tap into is the people that are in the same place. If a journalist is outside, that means a businessman is also outside of the country. So they tap into those things. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel and uh, Jeremy. So as we close everything now, I would like to take your last remarks. And uh, I would like to start with uh, Daniel and uh, followed by Jeremy and uh, Renata will help us close it all out. So Daniel, uh, what are your last remarks for this forum? Last remark is, that, again, you, I know that we're journalists. I love, I know that we love to tell stories and we like not to like be worried with the business side of it. Um, but at the end of the day, like what we have, it's a company. And if you have, if you want to expand, if you want your stories to have more impact, you're going to need more hands, you're going to need more tools. And that means you need to plan and you need to understand that, that or partner with someone that understands the business side of it. Uh, but you need to take that into account because the saddest thing that can happen is that because of not being sustainable or not being able to, to sustain your company, your stories that you want to tell don't get told so 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 i think that's my my final remark just grind it's a hustle i'm really sorry this is the this is the, the, the profession that we chose uh it's it's a, it's a constant struggle of like trying to find ways to tell our stories thanks daniel and thanks paul thanks renata thanks for everyone for for being here and for for the the gathering that we have uh, everyone here is doing really important work in, in in the journalism that we do my my last word would be a recommendation which is to find someone new who you haven't yet met reach out to somebody expand your network along the lines of what i've been talking about today which is to say a lot of us work in our silos we have so much to do in our own daily lives, so many emails to answer, so many responsibilities and tasks that we often lose track of the phenomenal array of people around us and outside of our sphere. And you're part of this group today. There's lots of people on this call 
who you could reach out to and have a conversation with and learn from and potentially collaborate with. And that's a really crucial step, but it requires being assertive. It requires taking a little bit of a risk. Maybe the person won't write back. Maybe it's a little nerve wracking to reach out to somebody new. Maybe you don't have their email address and you have to do a little work and find it. Um, but the digital world we live in makes that possible. You can find almost any, anyone's contact information if you dig a little bit or you try. And by reaching out to more people, you expand your network and you expand your potential and you expand the possibilities. So you have to go forward though and do that. You have to step outside of your comfort zone, reach out to new people and not necessarily people like me, people who are doing something like what you're doing, um, but in a different country or in a slightly different circumstance or in a different city um, or at a different stage in their life, organizational life or, or in a similar stage. Um, so I encourage you to, to do that. Be proactive, reach out, expand your network, reach one new person today or this week. That's a good start. Thank you so much, Jeremy and Daniel. Thank you for being incredible panelists. I really appreciate your contributions to this discussion. And um, I, as you can see, our audience really enjoyed the session and they were really, really um, inspired. And I know lots of those that attended this session would have gained one or two things uh, from this session. Hopefully, um, it's going to make uh, their journalism uh, career uh, less stressful. And um, hopefully, we are going to see uh, uh, a lot of testimonies uh, emerging uh, from this session. So as we close it up, I would like to invite uh, Renata uh, for our closing remarks and uh, whatever insights uh, that she wants to share uh, regarding uh, Elevate and um, probably wrap up um, what our panelists have done said today. So Renata, what are your closing remarks? I'm very happy to see how many people from so many countries join our session today and it's and, and to know that you are interested in the sustainability part of the business so don't overlook the sustainability part i know the content is important of course um you all do amazing work to our democracy to uh keep everyone informed but don't forget the business part of your business elevate is here to support you next month we'll have another session uh, stay tuned for Paul's emails um, and we'll see each other next month. Thank you very much. So on behalf of the International Center for Journalists, I want to thank everybody that has attended this session and I hope you've gained one or two things and uh, we have an active uh, social media network or uh, a Facebook group, which I really, really encourage you to join. If you look at the chat box right now, I just dropped the link. Click that link. It is going to take you straight to the Facebook page and uh, request to join and you are going to be added. In that group, we share information, we got an update regarding this webinar. We also share resources and opportunities for, for journalism and media entrepreneurs. I can see a lot of our members already in this group, and we also, and I can also see some of them that are actually watching this session via live stream. Thank you, thank you very much, everybody that has been part of this. And I can see that the chat box is highly interactive. So please and please, if there is a link that you need to keep before this session ends, quickly copy that link before uh, we end uh, the show today. To learn more about this initiative, uh, and of course, to learn more about Elevate and several other initiatives by the International Center for Journalists, check out the ICFJ's website on www.icfj.org. And for you to access uh, tools and resources and opportunities for journalism, I want you to check out the International Journalist Network's website on www.ignet.org. And on behalf of the entire team, on behalf of everybody that uh, was involved in making this session to, uh, to come together, I really want to say thank you very much for joining us today. A big thanks to Daniel and, of course, Jeremy uh, for being amazing uh, panelists, uh, for helping us to have this conversation, uh, making it rewarding. And I really want to say thank you very much. And we'll say um, enjoy the rest of the day and bye from me.